Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, it's, uh, we're talking a little bit, like you saw in the video, it says I'm all in, you know, and, and it's a, a heart of worship, and there's so many things you can talk about when you get into worship, and there's so many things you can talk about when you get into the kingdom of the Father, you know, the kingdom of Yahweh, and um, there's a lot to be said. Let's just put it that way, and so there's definitely no lack of, Father, what do you want to say here? Well, there's a lot, you know. But I do believe there are certain times and certain seasons that he wants to reveal some things to us and certain calls that he's put on, our, uh, on us. And, and just like the fall feasts, of these things are coming up. There are times to meet him and certain things he wants to do in our life in specific ways. So we just kind of keep our eyes open, keep our ears open, and see what he wants to do, right? One of the things I feel that he wants to do in this point is a worshiping warrior. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty neat when you, when you uh, look at some things that are involved in the IDF, you know, the Israeli Defense Force, because when, when, uh, when someone goes into the Israeli Defense Force, you know, they issue them a prayer book and a tallit. Can you imagine if, if, if like here in America, you know, they, someone signs up to go into the army and, and we give them a Bible? Wow. Can you imagine the, the <laughs> what would happen? But you see, the thing is, the people of Israel have not forgotten who their defense is. Amen. And uh, as, as much as we need to not lose sight of who is our defense. And because he said he would go before us. And, but we do know that, that at the same time, that means that there are battles to face. Right? So there's a lot to be said. Now, I want to kind of relate this a little bit in the aspect of the kingdom. We'll kind of tie that together at the end. But uh, we've got a lot of ground to cover, so uh, uh, put on your seat belts and uh, fasten down your hats, you know, and uh, let's jump into it. You ready to roll? All right, let's start with this. Isaiah, Isaiah says this, Isaiah 14, 12. It says, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend to the heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend high above the clouds, and I will be like the most high. Well, there's so many things you can talk about just this portion of scripture. But one of the things I want to point out is an uh, area of this, where he says, I will sit at the mount of the congregation, is Bahar Moed. Har is mount, Moed is congregation or assembly. What else do we know as Moed? The feasts, the festivals, the appointed times, the appointed places and, and, and times that the Father has given for us to meet together as, as a glory to him. And uh, so one of the things we see here is that the adversary wanted to receive worship, and the battle is over who you will worship. Now, the interesting thing when it comes to this is, Really, you know, Hasatan wants to receive your worship, but he really doesn't care so much if you do, as long as you don't worship Yah. See, if he can just distract you off of what you should be doing. You know, it's kind of like James says, if you know what to do and don't do it, it is. Yeah. So that's, that's, a, few, that's a few things we want to look at. So who and how we worship is closely related to the battle we're in. thing is, the worship and the word needs to go hand in hand. They work together in our life, and, and we need to make this a part of our, our lives at home. It's not just something we do when we get together. It's, it's a part of the, something that the Father wants us to have all the time. The problem is we always tend to get stuck in one of two camps. It's either all about worship or all about the Word, and, and they need to work together. <laughs> you know, Because if it's all about worship and no Word, then you're not able to discern what you may be moving in, but if it's all just the worship, all, all the word and the worship, where's, where's your uh, joy and rejoicing and everything? There needs to be working together here. And you know what's funny about this? You know that the majority of the disputes and arguments in most churches and ministries, it's not out there. It's normally between the pastor and the worship leader. Why is that? just like this principle we're talking about here. <laughs> because th th these two things need to work together, and there needs to be a balance in these two things in order for us to go forward. Even, and I find this extremely interesting, if you were to go to Israel, which I really hope you get the chance, <laughs> you know, if you were to go to Israel, and you go to the wall, there's this big open area there at the edge of the wall, and people often gather there and just burst out in spontaneous dance. It's really cool. 
And you know who does it most often? The men. And you know what's really cool? Is when you'll see people in the IDF dancing in their uniforms. Amen. And they're there and they're dancing and they're in the, you know, part of their, like, training and instruction, they actually teach some of these people, you know, in, in the military, they teach them some of these dance moves to do this. Who does that? <laughs> you know, the idea is sometimes as, as, as part of the battle that we're called into, we're told to just simply rejoice. And we need to learn to put ourselves in his hands and to do that and to rejoice. But at the same time, we need to know the God that we serve. See? So let's, again, there's this balance in both of these things. And, and we need that in our lives, okay? Let's look at Psalm 144. Psalm of David, blessed be the Lord my strength, which does what? Teaches my hands to what? War and my fingers to? Teaches my hands to war. See, David knew there was a time and season for all things. There was a time to take out that bear. There was a time to take out that lion. There was a time to take out Goliath. And then there was a time to worship. There was a time for war, but then there was a time when he used the same hands to play the harp and to sing and to rejoice. I mean, if you read the Psalms, one-third of the Psalms, I mean, is just David lamenting and pouring his heart out and saying, I'm in a tough place, yeah? I put it this way. <laughs> one-third of the Psalms truly is David singing the blues. <laughs> <laughs> and you can hear it when you're reading it. But the emphasis always comes back to, but God. And see, and that's the point. There's, there's a time for everything that the Father is, is putting in our hearts and putting in our lives. But we need to keep our focus on all these things back at Him. Whether it's a time for war, whether it's a time to, to dig into the Word, or whether it's a time to worship, we need to be active, involved in these things. My goodness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield and He whom I trust, who subdues the people under me, so if you go through and you read the rest of the psalm, you find that David is acknowledging that even though he says that, that God teaches my hands to war, but who's actually doing the warring? The Father is. So David is saying he teaches my hands to war, but the one who's actually fighting the battle is the Most High. But that means that sometimes he'll put you in the situations to be used in that capacity. Sometimes you're going to have to get on the battlefield. But sometimes it's not necessary. Again, learning, there's a time and a place for all things, right? What about Nehemiah? Nehemiah, Nehemiah, when he's rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, when he's rebuilding the city, this, this for him was an act of worship to the Most High. It wasn't just a matter of, oh, the city's down well. Here's a rebuilding opportunity. Let's make millions. You know, that, that was not it at all. This was not what he was doing. This was not his heart. His heart was to rebuild the city that was torn down, to rebuild the place that God said he, he, he was wanting his people to be there. I mean, Jerusalem, right? If we, if we read this in Nehemiah 4, so the construction workers, each one had his sword sheath at his side, and that is how they built. The man to sound the alarm on the shofar stayed with me, and I said to the nobles and leaders and the rest of the people, he said to who? Nobles and leaders and the rest of the people. Okay, so who's involved in this? Everybody who is there to help fulfill this task. Okay? This is a great work, and it is spread out. We are separated on the wall from one another. This doesn't mean that they were completely separated. What it means is this is a great task, and, and we've got people stationed throughout the whole wall, and we're rebuilding. You're rebuilding your section. You're rebuilding that section. But, like, we're, I'm here. You're way over there. He's way over there. And he's way. So this was a great task. And by the, by the idea that he's saying this, there really probably wasn't enough people to really do what needed to be done, but they're going to do it anyway. Right. Okay, so here they are. They're going to set up and they're going to be building, but he tells them to do something. He says, but wherever you are, when you hear the sound of the, do what? Come to that place and our God will fight for us. So the idea here is that though the people were rebuilding the walls and rebuilding, we're talking about restoration people, they were rebuilding the things that, the, that was what the Father wanted. And so as they're doing these things, those, they're, they're separated, even though they may be scattered out all over the wall, they're still operating as one people, still operating as one unit. They're all still working in unity. And when the sound of the shofar came, they all came to gather. They all came to wherever that shofar was blown, they all came to that point to prepare themselves for what needed to happen next, for whatever that was. 
You know, there are different sounds of the shofar. There are different calls that go forward. And they meant different things, right? Some of the calls were calls to battle. Some of the calls were just calls to assembly. I mean, just to kind of use an example here, they needed to discern the different sounds that were going out, the different sounds of the shofars. And this is what some of the leaders were, were to help with as well. Because if they were not able to discern the sound of the shofar, they, they didn't know what to do or how to respond, right? And so what would happen if they're sounding the alarm to come gather at the midst of the tabernacle and it was actually a sound to go out to war? Then they're going to come to the midst of the tabernacle for a time of gathering, for a time of worship, but they're getting, you know, alarmies coming against them. But at the same time, what if your army's camped all around there, but they actually sound the one to come gather, you think it's the sound for war, and you go out to fight your enemy alone. <laughs> See, there was, there was a midst of discerning what was being said, discerning the sound, discerning what was there. And guys, this is what I'm talking about. There's a time that the Father is doing certain things in our lives, and we need to learn to work together in that. Amen. Right? 21. So we kept doing the work, and half of them held spears from daybreak until the stars appeared. And also at that time, I told the people, let everyone with the servants stay the night within Jerusalem so that at night they can be a guard for us, even as they work during the day. Double duty. <laughs> they worked all day, and then they strung up lights and worked all night. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, if you ever had a job where you did stuff like that, but it's not fun, man. When... Uh, when I, when I first started seeing my, you know, my now wife, you know, when, when we first started seeing each other, her dad owned a construction company, ran a drywall business. She has five brothers. They all did drywall, right? So when I go in to date her, guess what I now did? <laughs> drywall. <laughs> So as I was I'd go to school during the day and we'd get off school and we'd go go to work, you know. But uh, the thing is, you only had so many hours of daylight after school. And so you know what happens after a couple hours after that? All the lights come out. And like, well, it's dark. Don't matter. We ain't done. <laughs> Guess what? You work till you're done. It's done. So you go home, you're done, you go home, take a shower, get cleaned up, and now go to school. Many times it was like that. And I think about Nehemiah, when he, when he was going through, he's building on the wall. It's like, so we're building, and, and at night is when the adversary, you know, tries to catch you off guard when you're tired and everything, and you're trying to recuperate. That's when the adversary tries to say, boom, right? Well, guess what? That's when they station additional guards so people can still keep working. Do we have that kind of tenacity? We have that kind of dedication. I mean, either it's a great call and a great cause, or it's not. Right? In Nehemiah, it was his heart to restore. It was his heart to rebuild. So here's what happened. So I, my kinsmen, my servants, and my bodyguards never took off our clothes, and everyone who went to get water took us off. What did it mean they never took off their clothes? It meant that, guys, how much sleep do you think they got? <laughs> that's, that's the point. That's what he's saying. Isaiah 40, 31 says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up as wings of uh, eagles. They shall run and not go weary. Here's a question. Well, it says they shall wait upon the Lord. What does it mean to wait? You know, there's different for, uh, definitions to the word, right? You can say, well, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to wait. <laughs> and then there's the other definition. It's the complete exact opposite of that. You know, here's an example. If you were to go to a restaurant, the people that are there to serve you are called wait staff. <laughs> so if you go to a restaurant and you're looking around to see, well, where's that person that was taking my order? Oh, they're waiting for you in the break room. <laughs> well, they're waiting for you. <laughs> you wouldn't like that, would you? Well, the idea is that that's not the point. That's not the wait. The word there for wait means to serve. And so when we say, well, they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength, and we think that just means, okay, just, just, you know, just wait on him and just wait on him. No, he told us what he wanted us to do in the meantime while we're waiting. Yeshua said, occupy till I come. That's a military term, guys. <laughs> occupy meant you're doing something. 
You're, 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 t- you're holding what the Father gave you, and you're working within it, right? Deuteronomy 3.28 says, To charge Joshua and do what? Encourage him and strengthen him, because he shall go over before this people, and he shall cause them to inherit the land which you see. One of the things with Joshua, I mean, it's amazing. Joshua was a warrior. Joshua also was a worshiper. It's amazing when you look at it and you, and you see the story with them. Good numbers 32. Surely none of the men that came up out of Egypt from 20 years old and upward shall see the land that I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob because they have not wholly followed me. Save Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the, Ken, the, the uh, Kenizzite, and Joshua, the son of Nun, for they have wholly followed the Lord. Now when it says they have wholly followed the Lord, Hebrew is he mil'u acharei Yahweh. This word mil'u is the word that's male, which means to fill, to be full, to accomplish, confirm, consecrate, also gather. To gather ourselves together. Here's just something just to kind of throw out there. You know when the scripture in Matthew 5, when, when Yeshua says, I have not come to do away with the Torah of the prophets, but to fulfill? The Hebrew word that they used to relate to that Greek word there is this word, which means to fill, confirm, consecrate, gather, or to be whole. So this is what he's looking at. So they wholly followed him. In the presence of wholly followed him, they were ones to do what? Gather. What was their heart when they, when they went to the, the spies, they went out and they came back, right? They, they, they went out as, as 12 went out, tourists, literally, the way it says in the Hebrew, and then they came back divided, 10 against 2. What did Caleb and Joshua want? They wanted to gather the people together and take them to the promise because Yah said we can do it. They trusted him. They believed him. For no other reason than he said so. Do you need any more? We really shouldn't. You know? So the rest of them, they, they were kind of you know, wavering. But Caleb and Joshua, think about this for a minute. Caleb and Joshua, they maintained the witness of the promise. They were a representation, a representation of all the tribes. You think of two witnesses when you think of the two, right? Isn't it interesting that Caleb and Joshua, Caleb from the, from the tribe of Judah, and Joshua from the tribe of Ephraim. Caleb and Joshua were the ones standing in the testimony saying the promise is ours, but you have Ephraim and Judah standing there saying the promise is ours, we can hold it, we can take it. Hmm. You really want to make a rabbi's head spin? You can do this. <laughs> Joshua stayed in the tabernacle. There, was, there were times when, it, when the scripture says, and Moses got up and went out, but Joshua stayed in the tabernacle. The scripture also says that a Levite was the one who was to be in the tabernacle. You cannot be something other than a Levite and be in that tabernacle like that. Joshua was an Ephraimite. Why was he permitted? You figure it out. (laughs) Homework on Shabbat. (laughs) So why Joshua? Exodus 33. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend and he turned again into the camp, but his servant, Joshua, that says a lot right there, but his servant, Joshua, you know, we we, we find it beneath us to serve one another. We think, but if I serve you, that means you're elevating yourself over me, and that's a completely wrong attitude. I mean, didn't Yeshua say, the greatest among you will be? Servant of all. We should learn to serve one another and be, be, be humble to one another. It doesn't mean that I think you're great. It means I love, my, I love Yah. <laughs> so we should learn to do that. But a servant Joshua, the son of Nun, the young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. That's what we were looking at. So even preparing for worship prepares you to receive the word that comes forth. Sometimes, you know, just here's an example. I, I know none of us can relate to this. Sometimes you just have a tough day at work. I know we've never been there. And sometimes it's, it's kind of a push to kind of get here before Shabbat starts. Right? Never happens. But when we come in, can we honestly truly say, 
as we walk in the door, we go to sit down, I am in the right frame of mind to worship him and to receive from him and to focus on the, on the word. Not really. <laughs> Let's be honest. We're all, you know, just kind of going, oh, I made it. You know? <laughs> so it takes a minute. It's okay. But it takes a minute for us to kind of refocus. Guys, that's what worship helps us do. It helps us take our eyes off of the day and the circumstances and the things that are going on around us and to just focus. Psalm 100 says, a psalm of praise. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with? Notice, I don't see that where it says it has to be in key. (laughs) That's my saving grace in it. But know that the Lord, he is God. It is he that made us and not ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Here's the thing. Why does it say, make a joyful noise and come before him with singing? And then he says, you don't belong to you. Essentially, it's what verse 3 says. He is God. He made you, not yourselves. We're his people. We're his sheep. So, back to verse 2. Serve him with gladness and come before him with Okay, there you go. (laughs) There's so many places in the scripture where the Father is reminding us, you're not God. He is. And we belong to him. He said there's so many things he desires to work through us, but the first thing we need to understand is surrender. Right? You're like, but I'm not even French. (laughs) It's okay. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, wow. Like, did he really just say that? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Verse 4. It says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with Praise. There you go. And bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. You see, that's how we, that's how we work in. That's how we come before him. We, we, first, we bless his name, come to his courts with praise, and then his gates with thanksgiving. It's a process of entering in. It's not a formula. It's just his desire for us. You know, if you, take, if you take what the Father is giving in his word, and you try to map out, this is the formula of how to do this, it, it's not going to, no. It's not the way the word works, guys. It, it's, it's meant to be a part of you. Right? That's why David said, your word have I hid in my heart that I? Yeah, might not sin against you. And it's David's, David's desire at his heart was that I get the word in me so that I do what he wants me to do, not what I want to do. And, and, and do we see David really making a lot of excuses when he messed up and it was brought to him that he knew he messed up? I mean, we see where he messed up, right? But when it was brought to his attention, what did he do? He was quick to repent, right? That's the point. Deuteronomy 31.7. So Moses called to Joshua and he said to him, In the sight of all Israel, be strong and of good courage, for you must go with this people. <laughs> I like how he says that. <laughs> be strong and of good courage because you got to go with them. <laughs> I just, it's, it's just the way my mind works, you know? It, it's, it's, <laughs> it's just scary sometimes. But, but, it, but it's, it's the idea of, you know, so... so just as, as, the, as, as the father was with Moses, he said he was going to be with Joshua. It didn't matter what, was, what they were going to face or what they are going to have to go through. The father said, I will lead you there. I will take you there. But Joshua, you are going to lead the people into this. Okay? And so he says, you're going to have to do this because you will cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, it is he that goes before you. He will be with you. He will not fail you nor forsake you. Fear not, neither be dismayed kind of interesting when he says be strong and of good courage and don't be afraid because okay how many of you if I came to you and the first thing I said was okay now don't be scared the very first thing you're going to think is oh my gosh why <laughs> guess, guess what <laughs> see we need, we need to break that cycle we need to break that thought process we shouldn't be thinking that way because when we read in the scripture where it says, fear not, we're looking for the why we're supposed to be afraid. <laughs> like, fear not, because there's a million of them coming after you, you know, kind of a thing, right? But he says, fear not. Do we really need to read the rest of it? 
I mean, for the sake of faith, you know, it's, he says, don't be afraid. Whatever it says after that, it's just letting us know. It's not to, it's not to shake your heart. It's, it's a matter of, you know, Father saying, this is going to happen, but I have a plan. Right? Joshua 5, 13. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, there stood a man over against him with a sword drawn in his hand, and Joshua went out to him. There's this man there, and he's got his sword drawn, and Joshua goes running to the guy saying, hey, are you for us or against us? <laughs> now there's that fear not thing. <laughs> right? Yeah. He wasn't afraid to run to the battle. He wasn't afraid, you know, to do that. And then when it was brought to his attention, who was standing before him, what did Joshua do? He fell on his face. He worshipped. Right? Look. So said, Nay, but as captain of the Lord of hosts of, of, of the Lord, I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What says my Lord to my servant? And the captain of the Lord of hosts said to Joshua, Loose your shoe from your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. Basically, this is Joshua's burning bush moment. This was the father reiterating to him what he was calling him to do and what exactly he was setting before him. Because, you know, the, even though Moses did it, even though he, 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 it was in sight of all Israel, you can't help but Joshua kind of thinking in the back of his mind, can I really do this? And this was the father telling him, yes, because I put you there. Right? So, they were going to Jericho, and they were told to blow the trumpets and to do these things, but there were certain things that were supposed to happen. Okay? Numbers 10 Let's make two trumpets of silver, a whole piece that you shall make them, that you use them for the calling of the assembly, for the journey of the camps, verse 3. And then you shall blow with them, all the, assemb all the assemblies shall assemble yourselves to you at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And, uh, but if you blow with one trumpet, then the princes and the thousands of Israel. So this is what it's looking at. So the idea here is, when they, when they blow with this, all the people were assembling, right? So the call that went forth was to bring the people together. And when you blow with the alarm, then the camps that uh, lie in the east part shall go forward. When you blow with the alarm a second time, the camps, again, when the, when the congregations be gathered together, you shall blow, and all those different things. The sons of Aaron of the priests shall blow with the trumpets, and they shall be to you for an ordinance forever throughout your generations. And if you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresses you, you shall blow the alarm with the trumpets, and you shall be what? Remember before the Lord your God, and you shall be saved from your enemies. So, when you're reading the scripture where it says the Father, where he, said, where he tells you, and you shall be remembered, it's not like, oh yeah, I forgot about those guys. Boy, I'm glad they're making a noise. Now I can remember them. That's not it at all. See, when the scriptures say that, and God remembered, the word for remember literally means to now work on behalf of. It means something is being done on behalf of them. And it's translated as remembered, okay, or a memorial even. Okay, so what it says here, that to sound the alarm, to me, this is kind of God saying, <laughs> watch this, because <laughs> he's about to do something, Amen. you know, it, and he's good, it's not like he forgot them, it's a matter of saying, now I'm going to act on their behalf, and you will see what I'm about to do, Amen. right? Deuteronomy 1.30, the Lord your God goes before you, and he shall fight for you according to all that he did for you in Egypt. For your eyes. So, will he do this if we don't sound the trumpet? Or are we as trumpets sounding the right voice? Are we sounding a unified call? Or are we all sounding our own thing? Now, here's something I really love the sound of the shofar. But if you get a room full of 30 shofars and they're all doing different calls, it's just noise. But if you get them all working together, that'll tear the roof off. <laughs> and it'll, it'll make an impact. I mean, you can feel it. You know? And that's kind of the point. Are we working together to sound a unified voice? And notice I didn't say perfect, exact replicas. I said unified. Because one of the things that you talk about unified voice, forgive me if you don't understand this, just bear with me for a minute, but even musically, to make a chord, they're not the same notes. There are multiple notes that are given to make a chord, but when you play the chord, it sounds pleasant. Yes. If you play it properly. <laughs> <Right>. Which, 
we all mess up. But that's the point, that when you build a quarter, when you construct a symphony, or when you do things like that, it's amazing. So what happens if everyone comes in and they like, I don't care what key it is, I don't care what song we're playing, I don't care what the notes are, I'm playing this song. And everybody does that. It's chaos. But can we at least sing the same song? <laughs> it doesn't have to be perfect. Let's just at least sing the same song. That's kind of the idea. Let's learn to work as a unified voice, to work together towards something that's bigger than ourselves. Because if we can't look beyond ourselves, we truly miss the point. So, here. The word, no denying, is vital to our walk. Amen? Because like I say, how do you know the God that you serve unless you find out who he is? Okay, so the word is vital to our walk. But worship is also vital to how we receive that word. They need to work together. So here's an idea. When we truly, intimately know Yahweh, then we will trust him. Can you really, truly trust somebody you don't know, whether know by yourself or know by reputation of someone you trust? Can you truly trust them? If we don't trust our auto mechanics, you hear me? Why are we going to, I mean, are we going to put that level of trust in somebody we don't know when they're wanting to speak into our life what the word says? This is my point. You truly need to trust someone. So if we truly trust Yahweh, then we'll just receive from him, no matter what he says, and walk in it, no matter what it is. Because that's his heart for us, to walk with him. And let's just face it, sometimes there are things he's asked us to do, it's beyond our realm of understanding. That's where faith happens. Right? All right. Isaiah 43. So now, uh, but now, thus says the Lord that created you, Jacob, he that formed you, fear not, why? I have redeemed you. Fear not because I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and neither the flame kindled upon you. So what's the, what's the uh, idea of the waters, going through the waters? It's a mikvah. It's purification. It's cleansing. What about the fire? What does fire do in the scripture? Purifies. Cleanses. So the father is, don't fear these things that are coming because they're, they're, they're washing away the things that don't need to be there and they're there for your betterment to purify you and to make you what I've called you to be. Refiner's fire, if you will. You know, to burn away the wood, hay, and stubble and what's left but the, but the silver, pure silver and gold and the precious, the precious stones, right? So how does this go with the kingdom? What are we supposed to, to walk in this? Look at one thing. First, we're for kingdom is malchut. Malchut, okay? The interesting thing, and, and how, how does this tie with the kingdom? Well, the word for war is malchama. The word for kingdom is malchut. The word for king is melech. It's all the same root, okay? So in the, in, in, in the kingdom, in malchut, you will see Melchama, but the Melech is present in it all. In the midst of it all, the king is there. Okay? So, the first use of Malchut is right after the Matovu. What's Matovu? You know, that guy that was hired to curse Israel, and he couldn't do it? Because every time he went to open his mouth, he actually blessed them? And he looks over Israel and he says, How lovely are your tents, Jacob, your encampments, Israel. They spread out like the valleys, like gardens by the riverside, like succulent aloes planted by Adonai, like cedar trees next to the water. Water will flow from their branches, their seed will have water of plenty. Their king, who's their king? Their king will be higher than Agag and his kingdom lifted high. Israel's king is forever. He reigns forever and is above every other king. Acts 1, 6 through 8. We're looking here. We see it's the 40th day of counting the Omer. Okay? So this is, you know, 
get, getting per, 10 days till Shavuot, right? So when they were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Why would they? I mean, after all this, he, I mean, here, he, the, the death, burial, and resurrection, he's, he's going to be ascending soon, and, and they're like, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Why would they ask such a thing? Why would they even be concerned with such a thing? Because they knew that his heart was to restore his kingdom to his people, was to, was to bring what he had for them here. And it's still going to happen. But look, verse 7. So he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. Hmm. Are you at this time going to do what we've been waiting thousands of years for? And he said, Why do you want to focus on that? There are more important things. Essentially. Why are we still focusing on that? When Yeshua is like, there's more important things. But he says this, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost will come upon you, and you shall be what? Witnesses to me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. Okay, so to have a kingdom, there's a couple things you need. One, you have to have, yeah, a king, <laughs> go figure, right? And you have to have a land, and you have to have people to be in that land, and you have to have a sovereignty, or, or better yet, a rule or authority. The decrees from the king. Okay? So, the interesting thing is when you have people in lands and you read how they, they go in, they conquer a land, so this king goes in, he conquers the land, and he sets up his kingdom, and he establishes his rules. This is how I'm going to run my kingdom, right? You know what's interesting? Is you find as, a, as, as Numbers is closing out, you're getting ready to go into the Deuteronomy, and uh, the, the, the closing part of Numbers and the beginning part of Deuteronomy, as you're reading through all that, you find something very interesting. You find that Yahweh brought his people to the edge of the promise. He equipped them with his word first, then gave them the land. He did it different than any earthly king would. He established he was their king, because he redeemed them, he brought them out. He gave them his word for them to walk in his kingdom while they were in the desert. And then he gave them the land. What's the emphasis there? The emphasis is not necessarily the land. The emphasis is his people. Because his kingdom, guys, he, the whole earth is his. <laughs> and so his kingdom was not just this little spot called Israel in the midst of the whole earth. His kingdom was within and among his people. Now, it was manifest in the earth in this place called Israel. But it actually was actually within the people that made up Israel. Matthew 6.33 Seek first what? His kingdom and his righteousness. Then all these things will be added to you. You know, when Yeshua was saying, you know, all these things of just daily life and daily things, he didn't say you can't hold a job or you can't do any of these things. What he was saying was, in the midst of everything, let the, all that drive, your drive be him. Seeking his life, his kingdom, his heart. <coughs> and then, all the, don't worry about the rest of the stuff. I mean, he'll make sure that you have what you need when you need it. You know, it's the whole taking care of the sparrows thing, right? Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do what my Father in heaven wants. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we? Now, here's the thing. There are things that they say that God is not opposed to them doing. Matter of fact, you talk to Yeshua, different things. There are things that he said that people would do. So what was the problem? The things that they were doing or they didn't have the heart do that. I mean, look at this. On that day, many will come to me, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we spell demons in your name? Didn't we perform many miracles in your name? And I will say to them to their faces, I never knew you. You did all these things in my name. It's not, and here's the thing, guys. His, you know, qu quote, name is not some enchantment that you can just kind of throw out there to make something happen. His name is his character. 
Okay? So, there are many people that are doing many things, but it says, worker of lawlessness? Here's the thing, let's not get caught up in that. Just because you see a miracle does not necessarily mean that that person that performed it is from God. Because here's, here's an evidence of it. Yeshua did not dispute what they did. He disputed their hearts. Their hearts were lawless. Lawlessness. And that word lawlessness is anomia. Now you guys know this. Here we go. That ah before means without. Nomia is, is the Greek word nomos. Right? Which means they translate as Torah, but it means law. So anomia means without law, but also, like I said, nomos, they translate as Torah. So without Torah. Those who say they're doing things and operating in his word, but they aren't really. They're doing their thing. They're doing what they think they should do, but not actually listening to what they're being told to do. Luke chapter 6, Yeshua said, why do you call me Lord, but don't do what I say? Matthew 8, 5. Let's look at this. So when Yeshua entered Capernaum, there came to him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lies at home sick of the palsy and grievously tormented. And Yeshua says, I will come and heal him. And what did the centurion say? The centurion said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but do what? Speak the word only and my servant will be healed. How, you know, Yeshua said, such great faith as in all Jerusalem, this man. Why would he say something like that? Because this man was not expecting, come and do some great big en enchantation or do, come and do some great grandiose thing to put to, so that I can see this miracle happen. He said, you know what? <laughs> I know who you are. Just say the word, it's done. Because he understood who he was talking to. I mean, after all, who has authority in the earth but the one that created it? Amen. And so here, he, he said, I understand. See, he said, I am a man under authority, and I'm a man that has authority. I say to that person, go, and he goes. I mean, think about that. There was no what's, ands, ifs, buts, or I don't want to. <laughs> if any of you have ever been, the, been in the military, you understand this. If you have a superior officer say to you, I want you to go do that, you don't say anything but yes. Sometimes even that's iffy. You just go do it. Right? <laughs> Some of you know this. I think one of the funniest stories from my dad. My dad is my dad is retired, 30 years active duty army. When I was growing up, he was a drill sergeant, and uh, he retired sergeant major. So, one of one of the funniest stories I think he ever told was when he was first in going into the service. He was in boot camp, and one of his officers said, "I want you." to go get that Jeep, take it over there, meet me over there, because you're going to take me to wherever it was. My father said, I'll get it when I'm ready. And the way my dad tells the story, and then everything went black. <laughs> and when, it, when I came to, I went and got that Jeep. And I took it where he wanted me to take it. <laughs> and he never again questioned that man. <laughs> the point is, he says, go, you go. There was not a question. There was not a, I don't want to. There was not a, an and, if, or but. There was, you go. And this man understood that it's that authority that Yeshua has. Because this man could operate under that authority within his ranks. He could not operate in that authority within somebody else's ranks. But Yeshua, captain of the Lord of hosts, <laughs> had all authority. And so when he said, just speak the word and it'll happen. That was faith that this man had. He said, I don't have to see anything. I just know it's done because you said it. Do we have that kind of faith? 
Here's the thing, guys. We have it written down for us. We have what they didn't. <laughs> we have it written down for us. Do we receive it with that kind of faith? For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, go, he goes, another come, he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does. So when Yeshua heard it, he marveled, and he said, Really, I say to you, I have not found so great a faith, not in all Israel. And I say to you, many shall come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Wow, amazing. So, there is a kingdom to come, right? I'm not, I'm not denying the fact that there is a, a literal kingdom to come, but does that mean that the kingdom is not here now? Luke 17, 20. So when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God comes not with observation, neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is over there. The kingdom of God is over there. The kingdom of God is over there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> the kingdom of God is within you and is fully functional and able to operate in your life right here, right now. But that does not mean there is not a physical kingdom that is coming. The problem with this is we get stuck in the mentality of someday it's going to get better. Someday we'll see the kingdom of Yah. Someday we'll see what's going to happen. And the Father said, why not now? Why not today? Because we're waiting to see the way we think it should be. And he's like, it's already here. You're missing it because you want it your way. It needs to be his way. So, the kingdom is more than a place. It's a life. It's a part of you. It's who you are. So how do we live? We need to live to be a people astute in the word with a heart of worship. And, they, and we need both. Look at 1 Peter 2.10. He says this. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. For before you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and temporary residents not to give in to the desires of your old nature, which keep warring against you. But God, this is the way I think it should be. Old nature, get rid of it. But this is how I think it should be. Old nature, get rid of that too. See, we need to get over the whole thing of this is what I think it should be. And we need to just see what he said and that's a daily thing that's a constantly renewing of, of what the father is telling us right because the problem is we get stuck in expectation of this is what i want to see and this is how i think he's going to do it and then when it doesn't happen that way then we lose faith why do we lose faith because we had our faith in something other than him we had our faith in what we thought and we need to have our faith in him 12 but to live such good lives among the pagans that even though they now speak against you as evildoers, they will, as a result of seeing your good actions, give glory to God on the day of his coming. Let, let your life be an example to them to lead them to the Father. 13. For the sake of the Lord, submit yourselves to every human authority, whether to the emperor as being supreme or to the governors as being sent by him to punish wrongdoers and praise those who do what is good. For it is God's will that your doing good should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Hey, John, what do you think Facebook's doing tonight? <laughs> 16. Submit as people who are free but not letting your freedoms serve as an excuse for evil. So, rather, submit as God's slave. We serve, we serve the Father, therefore we do what he says. 17. How should we live? Be respectful to all. Keep loving the brotherhood. Fearing God. Honoring the emperor. It all really comes down to a heart to glorify him. Really. And if we have that heart to serve him, then we're going to do the things the way that he says to do it. Even if we don't want to. Because we, we, we at least acknowledge his ways are better and higher than ours. Even when we don't understand, that's when we need to have the faith to do it anyway. Because sometimes you won't understand. 
But sometimes you won't understand until you get to the other side of it. I mean, how many of you can say, you know, I'm a little wiser now than I was 10 years ago? I would hope so. <laughs> That's kind of the idea, right? On the other side of it, you can look back and you can see what happened, even if you don't know in the midst of it. But we need to have the faith in the midst of it. We need to walk with him. So we need to know the God that we serve, and we need to know who you are in him. Amen? Let's all stand. <laughs> Shalom. <laughs> Numbers chapter 6. Yahweh told Moses and Aaron that when you bless my children, I will place my name upon them and I will give them peace. His name is his peace. It is his life. It is, it's, it's who he is. It's his character. And that peace means to be made whole and to be complete. So I ask you tonight, receive this as it was given to you to impart his life and his character to you to make you whole and to make you complete in his name. Let it be. As Yahweh told Moses and Aaron, when you bless my children, you shall bless them like this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace.